Can we talk about this article? No, seriously, can we talk about it? I'm surprised that this didn't make a bigger splash in social media. It was practically discussed almost not at all on Twitter or Reddit, and that surprises me given that the title of the article is Let's Destroy Bitcoin, and the source is MIT Technology Review. I'm very surprised that didn't make more headlines. I think a couple of cryptocurrency news websites covered it, but for the most part, nobody's really been talking about it, so I figured I would. Uh, This article is hilariously bad, and keep in mind that this is coming from somebody who's openly criticized Bitcoin. I've received a lot of flack over that, but you know, I've said before that Bitcoin is a bubble. I still think that it is. I've mentioned that I think that adoption is going to occur a lot slower than most people anticipate due to the trade-offs associated with decentralization. I think that you sacrifice a lot of convenience there. I also think that the security that a lot of people tout when it comes to cryptocurrencies is overstated because you really have to look at the security of the system as a whole, and that does include the user, which is where all cryptocurrencies tend to fall apart. The user interface tends to be awful, so on and so forth. There's a number of different criticisms that you can throw at cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin in particular. So I'm somebody that would be more likely to be receptive to this type of article than anybody else, right? Or generally speaking, that's going to be the case. And this article just was not persuasive. I was really looking forward to maybe some good arguments for how Bitcoin could be destroyed, maybe technical arguments, maybe socioeconomic arguments, so on and so forth. And this article really didn't go through with any of that. So the article starts off by introducing Bitcoin, just like most of these articles tend to do, and the competition from other cryptocurrencies. But the basic premise of this article is that while you may not be able to copy Bitcoin itself, you can copy the idea of Bitcoin. It's all open source and the technology is relatively easy to implement at this point, now that it's been discovered, so anybody can do it. So their first option here is the introduction of a central bank-backed cryptocurrency, or FedCoin, in this particular situation. So that would be a U.S.-based one, but obviously you can do this anywhere. You could have a Euro-based one. You can have a Ruble-based one. In fact, that one is currently in development, so on and so forth. The idea here is that because the central government has so many more resources and because obviously we all use dollars today, if they had it so that you redeemed your dollars for Fed coins and they essentially made it so that everything was replaced with Fed coins, of course that would naturally mean that adoption for Fed coin would escalate to the point where maybe Bitcoin would not be able to compete. One of the funny things, or one of the funnier statements that's made in this article is that Of course, if we're going to have FedCoin and we're going to base it off a blockchain, which you don't have to, but if we were to base it off a blockchain, you'd have to do a permissioned blockchain, which means you have to set up the nodes. And who would those nodes be? Well, they would be Bank of America, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. I love how they say basically trusted institutions. And the whole ideology behind cryptocurrencies is to get away from those institutions. I mean, if you look anywhere, it doesn't matter where you go, there is so much disdain for the banks, so much disdain for the government that it just makes me laugh to think that this is even an option in the first place. Because the problem with this option is assuming that people will adopt this Fed coin any differently than they already adopt the US dollar and make Bitcoin obsolete. The, the Bitcoin use case is still going to be there, right? It's not like FedCoin all of a sudden convinces people that are using Bitcoin now who are already making a ton of sacrifices to use it over the U.S. dollar. It doesn't offer any real new use cases. I, I don't understand that. And even in this article itself, they mention that you have to show your proof of identity to use FedCoin. So it's completely, it just goes against everything that's associated with cryptocurrencies. They also talk about the fact that a digital version of state-run currencies could match or even improve upon the efficiencies of Bitcoin. That sentence cracks me up because it really illustrates to me that the person writing this either is trying to get as much material as possible into this article 
uh, by stuffing it with some fluff statements like that, or they really don't know what they're talking about. Of course, a permission blockchain is always going to perform better than a permissionless blockchain, right? I mean, that it's it whatever. Uh, um, it frustrates me to even think that this type of sentence could be made, could match. It's going to destroy the efficiency of Bitcoin. It will be so much more efficient. It's not even funny. The, the whole thing is that you're sacrificing decentralization and censorship resistance and to a lesser degree, anonymous transactions. But Bitcoin really isn't anonymous, as everybody knows. So really here, none of that makes all that much sense, at least in my opinion. Then we have option number two, which is the Facebook sneak attack. Well, what the hell does that even mean? So the first example they make here is how Telegram is making their ICO with Grams. I don't think that's a good, we don't even know the, the current, we don't know the outcome of that situation yet. We don't even know how adoption for that is even going to happen. So why use that as an example? I, I don't think that makes any sense. Okay, so they move forward and they say here that Facebook could potentially persuade a large enough fraction of Bitcoin users and miners to run its proprietary version of the Bitcoin software. And if they could, then they could control the rules. Nobody would adopt Facebook's version of Bitcoin software. That is a complete joke. Have you seen the opinion of Facebook within the Bitcoin community? Do you honestly think, and keep in mind, right, the people that are running these full nodes are usually going to be much more sophisticated users than average Joe. Do you really think it's all that likely that they're going to run a client made by Facebook? I mean, it, it, some of this stuff is so insane, in my opinion, that it's even made to be an argument. But that's not their main argument. They say that there's an even better way that they could do it. So first, what they do is they create a Facebook-hosted Bitcoin wallet. And with their vast engineering resources and expertise in user experience design, they're going to make an awesome wallet. And everybody who uses Bitcoin, because the experience is going to be so vastly superior, they're going to move over to the Facebook wallet. So there's a number of issues with this argument. First of all, it makes the assumption that just because Facebook has more resources, they could create a better wallet than the ones that exist out there today. And this is a fallacy that I see quite frequently from people who think that the more money you throw at a problem, the more resources, the more employees, the better the solution you're going to get. And there is nothing further from the truth. If you really go into the real world, uh, you're going to find a lot of situations where there are bottlenecks that are just time. You, you can't throw additional other types of resources. You can't throw more developers at it. You can't throw more money at it. There's nothing that can speed up the process except time. And time is not something you can throw at something other than to obviously spend more time on it. And what I'm really trying to say here is that there's this implicit assumption that Facebook is going to be able to design a wallet that's superior to all of the ones out there today. The one thing they might be able to do better for sure is this user experience design, right? The UI. But otherwise, I don't see Facebook ever being able to, or any other company for that matter, that's you know different from a crypto company, for example. That's the basic premise here. It doesn't matter if it's Facebook, it could be Google, it could be Twitter, so on and so forth. I really don't think the resource difference is what's important. It's about really, Bitcoin itself has a lot of quirks that are very difficult uh, to work out that you can't, just because you're Facebook, you can't overwrite those quirks. So that's the first thing I want to say that's wrong with this particular argument. But they say basically more and more people adopt this Facebook wallet because overnight they allow every single Facebook account to have it. Over time, they also enable users to let Bitcoin or rather let Facebook mine Bitcoin with their computers unused processing power. This is something that we've seen a number of different websites do, usually with Monero, but we've seen it happen with Bitcoin as well. And then eventually they take control because they have a significant portion of the mining power and they have a significant influence over the network. It's complete bogus, right? The assumption that anybody is going to switch over to Facebook is just, again, if you've seen the opinion within the community over Facebook, it's very unlikely. So again, just more fluff. And then we have this final argument in this article that talks about the idea that we're finally going to have a society where you can pay for any good or service 
with practically anything. You're going to have FedCoin, Facebook Coin, Apple Cash, Toyota Cash. Then you can pay for your groceries with a fraction of a share of Apple stock, which, first of all, that is completely insane. There's no person or very few people who would ever want to pay with any asset that they would have to recognize capital gains for every single time that they make a transaction. In fact, that's part of the issue with cryptocurrencies right now, which they could have brought up in this article, but they didn't. Uh, so, you know, there's a number of factors here that, that, you know, first of all, this world is completely absurd, in my opinion. Uh, the idea that we have all these different types of ways or payment methods, I, I don't, really ever see that happening. There was also that story a while back with Facebook. I think they wanted to implement their own currency of some sort. I think that completely failed. Facebook credits or something. I, I don't remember. I don't use Facebook personally, but I do remember reading something about that. If they couldn't even do it on a small scale basis, what is the likelihood that the entire world or even just the United States is going to adopt this massive multi-currency system where anything can pay for anything. And they're going to have this infrastructure where you can automatically swap between all of these different assets. It's just far too confusing. It's it's the internet of money, but you know, the internet, I'm, what I'm going for is the internet of things, but moved over to money. But because Andreas Antonopoulos made the internet of money a, a real term, it I don't want to confuse anybody with that. But it, it's just as confusing and as difficult to follow as the internet of things is. We don't want to do that with money. At least that's my opinion. No, I don't think anybody would really want that. Uh, and they make this argument that that's already happening because of all the altcoins. That's absurd in my opinion as well. And uh, again, he thinks that the infrastructure is eventually going to be there to automatically swap between all of these things, and that's where we're headed. Uh, that's bogus. That's really bogus, in my opinion. So we've already basically said that these three different options are completely absurd. And then they close out the article by saying that, you know, what's the benefit of Bitcoin? And they say that Bitcoin enthusiasts tout this all the time, which is that Bitcoin transactions are anonymous and impossible to censor. Most Bitcoin enthusiasts are not saying that Bitcoin transactions are anonymous because they're not, right? Even if you use a mixer, you're still going to have a lot of issues associated with Bitcoin because of the traceability associated with them and because they're not truly fungible. So most people don't think that Bitcoin transactions are anonymous. And really, this whole sentence here was just there, okay, was just there to set up this particular sentence later on to say that realistically speaking here, Bitcoin blockchain isn't anonymous. So he really was just, the author was setting themselves up. So that, in my opinion, was, a, they just did a lot of different things in this article that were questionable. They did close out the article very well. I think a couple of statements that were useful with networks, convenience wins, and convenience is based on size. There's a couple of other factors that go into convenience, but that is definitely one of them. And if cryptocurrencies are to be widely used, it will be the habits of the masses, not the wishes of Bitcoin's early adopters, that determines what becomes of Satoshi Nakamoto's vision. And I also think that that is entirely possible as well. Also, I think I referred to the author as a him earlier, and apparently it's a her, so I apologize for that. Don't want to trigger anybody. But overall here, this particular article, I felt this was just very poorly done overall. Uh, aside from the conclusion there, which I felt like was fairly well done, I think those are some interesting statements. Uh, yes, I do think that if cryptocurrencies, or at least specific cryptocurrencies, are going to be widely adopted, yes, it's probably going to have to cater a little bit more to the masses and less to this ideology of decentralization. But I just wanted to talk about this article because I thought it was funny. I, let's destroy Bitcoin. It really felt like they took a rubber hammer, not a sledgehammer, to Bitcoin. I will show you guys in the future how you take a sledgehammer to Bitcoin and talk about how you can have that entire ecosystem fail and how you could really destroy Bitcoin. Maybe not you in particular, but ways in which Bitcoin could fail. And I think a lot of it has to do with destroying the underlying price support, because a lot of what Bitcoin comes from is really this speculation, right? A lot of Bitcoin support comes from speculation. That's where most people find out about Bitcoin, and that's how most people stay interested in Bitcoin. So I honestly think that, you know, if a government wanted to go after Bitcoin, 
then the G20 countries would have to shut down fiat gateways. They'd have to make it illegal to transact in cryptocurrencies, make sure that everybody understands it's a threat to the nation state. That type of thing could definitely not destroy cryptocurrencies, but destroy any hope of mass adoption. So I don't know what this article was. I think it was just, I don't know. I think it was mostly fluff and clickbait, but I wanted to talk about it because I thought it was an interesting title that maybe caught the attention of a few of you, and I just felt like, you know, destroying it. So, hope you guys enjoyed this video. As usual, if you did like it, make sure you check out my Steemit if you would like to support me. There's also a lot of more usually higher quality comments on there, so you can read those if you're interested. Otherwise, as usual, leave a like, comment, and subscription, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you for watching.